Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Tuesday, January 7th, 2025. Today we are going to discuss the microscope you see behind me, uh, looking for seeds in just one place, and some of the changes with no-till growers coming up. So let's do it. I'm out uh, surveying the farm and the ice, and you can hear probably that's the snow. It's like rock hard. It's really hard to walk on. Uh, wanted to come and see how the tunnels were doing, <laughs> and you can see there's like the ice buildup. It's just like cascading over the side of the tunnel is kind of coming down in a sheet. If you're not watching this on uh, YouTube, you can, I'll try and put a picture up on Instagram or something, or you can click over to YouTube, but it's wild. I mean, this has got to be super heavy. I'm really glad I cleared the snow off. Woo. All right, so ice storms are clearly fun. I recorded that short clip walking around the farm yesterday, uh, and after I recorded it, we got probably another two inches of snow on top of the ice, but at least as I get this episode together, the tunnels are fine. Uh, but man, that is so much weight on those structures. Uh, that one is from Rimmel, if anyone is curious. Really glad we stabilized our cat tunnels back in 2023 with trusses and wind bracing and all that stuff too, especially right now, apropos of yesterday's episode about souping up the tunnel. Uh, it's really hard to clear ice safely off of a tunnel, especially with the ground being <laughs> below it being slick, like I kept falling while I was trying to do it. Uh, someone had mentioned that there are really long high tunnel brushes available. And I think if we got slightly more snow here in Kentucky, I'd invest in one. But some years we get almost none. And then some years we get multiple like six inch snowfalls. And then some years we get ice and it leaves tons of people without power, but somehow not us. So appreciative of that. Uh, again, shouts to all the power workers out there that are doing like power lines in this freezing cold temperatures that are covered in ice. That's a tough job. Um, and one of those people is my hay guy. So, hey, Russ. Anyway, one question I get a lot on the YouTube channel is about the microscope that if you're watching this, you can see it right here in the background. Uh, do I use it? What is the brand? Why is it turned on? Those sorts of things. Okay, so uh, a few years back, I was very inspired to start getting into microscopy and bought a nice microscope and camera mount and started to use it to explore, you know, microbes and all those things. This particular microscope is the uh, Motic Panthera E2, I think, but it, I'll be honest, it's, it is probably overkill for what most people need, including myself. For me, I wanted something that would be good for videos and such, and it has mostly been that, but for generic microscopy, it's probably more microscope than necessary. Uh, whether it has been useful for my gardens is really a different question. You see, the thing is, I think it could be in theory. You could see a certain issue within a crop or cover crop, take a soil sample and check with the microscope to see how present or deficient the soil is and the right fungi, the right arthropods, beneficial nematodes, etc. Or maybe you find an abundance of the harmful root feeding nematodes that could be an indicator of some imbalance. And that could be addressed with proper application of a specially made uh, compost or compost tea or something like that. I think there's definitely a place for that. I know Elaine Ingham has done a lot of work educating about this in her courses. Graham Sate has talked about various ways to increase specific microbes in the Nutrition Farming podcast, uh, which in theory you could test those preparations with a microscope to make sure they actually work. There is a small smattering of free information online about how to identify the various microbes and address them, uh, address their deficiencies. Again, I totally think there's a way in which the microscope could be useful. I just admittedly have not had the time to really dedicate to it, and maybe even the impetus. To that last point, when I see poor production somewhere, I'm just going to apply the best, most diverse compost that I can and let the soil and the cover crops work it out because I'm working primarily in field conditions where the temperature, moisture, and crops are changing all the time. If I was working in a controlled environment, growing cannabis or something where every ounce mattered and every square foot of the soil could be somewhat controlled, that may be a different story. Like I probably would be hyper into microscopy in that sense. But for me, I'm not sure it would be as useful, uh, especially for the amount of time it takes to really explore a sample. Uh, I mean, sometimes 
by the time I'd be done exploring a sample, we could have gotten three inches of rain. So that said, I freaking love it at the same time. It is very cool and mildly creepy to see the microscopic world we inhabit and that inhabits us. It's elegant and vicious and bountiful and beautiful. Uh, I love having a microscope and I'm glad I bought it as a nerd and a photographer. As a farming tool, sure, it's fine and it probably could be better under somebody else's uh, management who has maybe more time than I have. Maybe it could indeed have actual utility. Just finding the time is tough for me. And to those who have asked, I turn it on just for a little background light. One day I will actually do something more attractive with this background, but for now, the microscope will have to do. Anyway, let me know your thoughts and questions as they pertain to microscopy. Uh, okay, when we come back, we'll get a question from a Patreon member, BRB. Today's episode of Growers Daily is brought to you by Peaceful Heritage Nursery. If you're looking for hardy and resilient fruit trees, berry plants, or pawpaw trees, then check out Peaceful Heritage Nursery. Peaceful Heritage Nursery LLC is a mail-order nursery shipping premium quality fruit trees and berry plants across the USA. They specialize in resilient, non-GMO plant genetics for small growers. Their diverse selection includes berries, cold hardy figs, passion fruit, gumi, mulberry, and much more. They're famous for their diverse selection of premium quality grafted pawpaw trees, five-star Google ratings, and customer testimonials attest to their commitment to excellence in quality and service. Find them at PeacefulHeritage.com and join their mailing list. Once again, find them at PeacefulHeritage.com. Use the promo code NOTILL, all caps, one word, for 10% off your first order. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this content, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no-till growers. I will try to get to questions from everywhere that questions come, but I will always get to those Patreon questions. Today's Patreon question comes from Patreon member Amy Blankenship, who writes, quote, you mentioned last month that your okra gets so tall, they are hard to harvest. I have a couple of thoughts. One, I'd pay good money for okra seed that makes okra the size of my beloved baby Bubba that's red. I hear you have red okra and are still and are looking to get into seed selling and one of those hmm emojis. Second, Mississippi Public Broadcasting's Felder Rushing suggests uh, to two to three callers every summer that they could increase their okra yield by cutting down their okra so it branches. I wonder if you could increase and lower your yield at the same time. See what I did there? Ending the quote here for a second. So I looked into this because I'd heard that topping okra can help with yields, but I had never actually uh, researched it. And I did find at least one study that suggested an 18% increase in yields when plants were topped 20 days after emergence, but saw a 7.5% decrease when plants were topped at 30 or 40 days. So that's interesting. I mean, I may play, need to play around with that a little bit this year. And this isn't the main part of their question, but as for selling our okra seed, maybe one day I would love to get into seed production uh, at some point in time. Anyway, back to the rest of Amy's question, quote, I'm reading your book and I'm into the part where you list all the varieties you use. One problem I have on seed sites is I don't have the patience to search for every variety that I'm interested in to find out which site has the most of them to reduce number of orders slash shipping. Is there an easy way, like a site where you enter what you want and it tells you the sites that sell the stuff on the list? Also, what's your strategy for keeping your hands warm when farming that maintains your dexterity in cold, wet weather? End quote. I love all these questions. This is fun. I mean, it's like a variety show of questions. So anyway, uh, to the question about keeping hands warm in cold, wet weather, it's all about a good pair of insulated neoprene gloves for me or neoprene gloves with a liner. Uh, in fact, two pairs is better than one, like having two pairs, not wearing two pairs, so that if you get one that gets overly saturated, you can just kind of switch to the dry one and then go back and forth as needed. Now to the question about uh, a searchable compendium like that, where all the varieties are found in one place and then you can, it lists who sells them. I'm not aware of one and I don't immediately see one in poking around though. Of course, if there is one, the commenters will let us know. And I'm sure somebody has put something together like that. I do several seed orders a season from several different companies. I think having a diverse range of suppliers is generally a good idea. Though I understand like it does take a lot of time. Now, I do still get the bulk of my seeds from Johnny Selected Seeds and High Mowing Seeds, which in full disclosure are both sponsors of this show. I used them before I started the show. I'll use them after. But I do think that's important for you to know. I also use Fedco Seeds, uh, who have the best group discount, just by the way. 
And I sprinkle in some Osborne, uh, some territorial, and for regionally adapted stuff, I always try to get some stuff from a couple small regional producers like Southern Exposure. Uh, they're over in Virginia, which is not too far from here. However, I would not suggest just buying the seeds that I use. My advice would be to try a few from the list that I put there, but also pick a few new ones to see if there's something that works better in your region and context. Also support some of those small regional seed producers as well that will um, have seeds more adapted to your climate and conditions. I always think about um, some of those ones that are growing up in the mountains, like uh, wild mountain seeds. They're up like in a high elevation in Colorado. Like if I'm in a high elevation, I want to find a high elevation seed purveyor, at least for some of my stuff. To find them, I mean, it's as simple as like Googling local seed purveyor and insert the state. And you may be surprised how many good ones are already around you doing cool things. Anyway, I know that's not exactly what you were looking for, but I hope that helps give you uh, some perspective on where to find seeds. Finding every seed in one place is probably easiest through the big guys, but you may not get the quality you're after, or uh, you may have to compromise in some ways doing it that way. So perhaps this is an area you may want to take your time and be patient and search for what sounds most applicable to your goals. Anyway, great questions and thanks for the support. Up next, we'll take a quick break. And when we return, we'll talk about how this wild company of no-till growers is changing a bit. Be right back. Today's episode of Growers Daily is brought to you by Harnwa Greenhouses. Arnwa Greenhouses has pioneered controlled environment agriculture since 1965, partnering with market gardeners and farmers across North America to deliver turnkey greenhouse solutions. Their unwavering mission is to support growers' success through innovation and expertise in design, manufacturing, and installation. Arnwa Greenhouses are engineered to withstand high wind and snow loads, providing optimal brightness, increased yields, rapid ROI, and long-lasting durability. With over 20,000 projects completed, they are more than a manufacturer. They are a trusted partner. Their structures foster sustainable, energy-efficient ecosystems that drive profitable, resilient agriculture. In 2025, Arnois is introducing a new low-tech high-tunnel model starting at just $2 per square foot, offering open field growers an accessible entry into controlled environment agriculture. Arnois Greenhouses, leading the way in turnkey solutions for local growers. Learn more at arnois.com. That's H-A-R-N-O-I-S.com. All right, back to the show. Okay, so I wanted to take a few minutes and talk about the future of no-till growers because we're making some kind of significant changes and some of you will be bummed and some of you will be excited and some of you will just listen to me rant about it because it's just your routine now, which is rad. Shouts to all of that. But yes, there are some big changes uh, coming to no-till growers in 2025 that I don't want to catch anyone off guard. First, though, a little history. In 2018, there was almost no information about how to farm without tillage or farm ecologically on an intensive market garden scale. And we were seeing lots of small farmers burning out left and right, including myself. Uh, I had started experimenting with no-till practices and seeing some promising results, especially in weed management, uh, but needed more insight wanted more techniques and tactics that could possibly help my garden and anyone else's garden. So I decided to start calling some growers uh, that I knew and was meeting and recording our chats for the No-Till Market Garden podcast in my walk-in cooler at our last farm. Uh, we had extremely poor internet then, and it was a wild ride with my Great Pyrenees often barking right outside as I was uh, talking to farmers next to bins of lettuce mix, which was fun. Uh, there was a lot of interest from myself and other growers in how to reduce our tillage, increase profitability, while also reducing workload. So the show gained a following pretty fast. Uh, my friend Jackson Roulette proposed that we make it into something greater, something bigger. And so we partnered uh, to form notillgrowers.com. Honestly, we didn't really know what it was at first. We figured we would make videos and podcasts, write some articles, aggregate some scientific studies and other stuff like that. And just see what kind of what it kind of developed into. And over the next six years or so, it blossomed into what we eventually came to refer to as a media company whose business model was effectively to sustain ourselves, pay people for their work while giving all the information away for free. So basically, we wanted to find a way to gather and distribute ecological growing information without paywalls, relying instead on selling hats, uh, selling my book eventually, small donations from you all, uh, through Patreon, uh, YouTube, and ad sponsors, that sort of stuff. In that way, it was a actually pretty dynamic model revenue-wise, but I'm going to be honest with you that it 
also nearly killed us. It turns out giving away information for free is not, it's a pretty tough business model. It very nearly bankrupted my farm in the first year getting this thing going. Uh, and it definitely bankrupted my health a couple times. And then for a while, it totally worked, like completely worked. We were able to get through several years making enough money to keep starting new niche shows, shows like the Composter Podcast, the Seed Farmer Podcast, the Winter Growers Podcast, and the Collaborative Farming Podcast, uh, bringing on podcast hosts, paying them, editing for them, managing all the annoying behind-the-scenes technical stuff that goes with podcasting, uh, and all that stuff. But the last couple of years, with the rise in short-form video taking eyes, thus ad revenue from YouTube, coupled with marketing budgets tightening, our revenue took a massive hit. Uh, in fact, we've had to take some operational loans and that sort of thing just to keep this thing afloat, hoping we could fix it, but we just couldn't quite make it work anymore in the same way. Market changes are brutal, uh, but they are also somewhat inevitable, and sometimes you just have to adapt and make some hard decisions. So in order to continue, last week we informed our brilliant podcast hosts that we'd be ceasing additional podcast seasons in 2025. Growers Daily, this, what you see and hear now, is going to continue and it will probably grow and do different things. And I'll probably bring some of those hosts on to chat with me as much as possible. Some of them will also be continuing their podcast independently and we will support them in every way that we possibly can. We're making sure they keep their equipment and have our full support in whatever way that they need it. I'm very proud of this work. I think it's been great. I've learned an enormous amount from all of these uh, contributors, but I mean, we just simply can't afford to keep them all rolling at the moment. And that sucks. It sucks a lot, frankly. However, this will give us time and capacity to reassess and find new ways to continue on our mission and help support people who are doing this kind of work or making change and keeping their info out in the open for anyone anywhere to see. Like I've said, the revolution ain't happening behind a paywall. I should also say that completely unrelatedly, Jackson Roulette, who not only helped me found this ridiculous business, but is also the host of the Collab Farming Podcast, one of my favorite projects that we've ever done, is moving on and taking an awesome job with our dear friends over at the Organic Association of Kentucky called Oak. We wish him the best of luck and love. Uh, he was a huge part of what made all of this information possible. He will be missed dearly, uh, but at least some of you in Kentucky may be working with him soon through Oak. Uh, so that's cool for our state, and I look forward to hearing about his adventures. Uh, so a lot of big changes in 2025, but as for this show, nothing is really changing with Growers Daily. I will almost certainly still occasionally do the classic Farmer Jesse videos, uh, especially as the season ramps up and I have something to film. But if you have any questions, feel free to let me know, and I will try to address them as best I can and update you as the picture becomes more clear what all no-till growers is up to going forward and how we are continuing to serve our mission, albeit probably on a slightly smaller scale, because we will. We just have to find more financially reasonable ways to do it. Anyway, huge thank you to Natalie, Mimi, Alex, Dan, Clara, Jane, Michelle, Jackson, Michael, Josh, Jenny, Miles, Iriel, Aaron, and everyone else who has given us their time and brain at some point to get so much great info out there. You will still see some of their shows coming up for the next couple months. Uh, so make sure to check them out and show them love and show them support, especially as they go independent. And you will hear about all of that from me. Otherwise, that's the update. I'm going to wrap it up there, though. Huge shouts to Willie Breeding for the theme music and the team at No-Till Growers for all of their support. Uh, pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook or the Seed Farmer at notillgrowers.com to support our work. Big thank you to everyone over at patreon.com slash no-till growers, where at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another or sign up in the month of January, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs today to, oh, it's our weeklies. Uh, we have Mena, Byron Green, I wonder if Byron Green knows we also now have a Brian Green that's almost spelled identical, but with an A, not an O. Never mind, it's not really that similar. Anyway, Mena, Byron Green, and Stephen Smith. Uh, this week, this trio is um, this is a this is a 900-page novel, and it is a uh, a story of a staring contest. In the opening scene. You, you kind of see the staring contest and you kind of get a sense for how intense it is. But as the novel unfolds, it sort of weaves all their stories together and kind of it gets progressively more complicated and you start to see why the staring contest exists and why it's so intense. Also written in that kind of like Jose Saramago style where it's like there's, there's maybe only like 15 periods in the entire book and you basically can never put it down. And it's called The Staircase because it was also written by a dad. All right. Thanks for watching and or listening. We will see you uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Bye.